Hi, welcome to Blogging Heads TV. This is Culturally Determined on Blogging Heads, and I'm your host, Arya Cohen-Wade. And my guest today is someone who probably needs no introduction for most Blogging Heads viewers, but I'll ask him to introduce himself anyway, uh, Michael Brennan Doherty. Hi, I'm Michael Brennan Doherty, and um, I am a columnist at theweek.com, and um, I am the founder and editor of The Slur, which is a newsletter about baseball. Uh, and you've seen me before, maybe. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, thanks for coming on. So uh, I asked you on because I had some questions about a recent kind of weird political controversy that struck me as unusual, but I think you would have some some valuable insights into it. And that would be the whole uh, discussion, the whole debate that came from President Obama uh, mentioning the Crusades and the Inquisition at the National Prayer Breakfast. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be talking about the Crusades today. So we're, you know, this is real, this is real clickbait <laughs> here. This is yeah. pandering to the masses. Um, and I'll just say at the start that I basically know almost nothing about the Crusades. Uh, so I'm mainly just going to be asking questions. And, uh, you know, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade is my favorite movie, but that's about, <laughs> that's about all I know. Um, so, so, I mean, why do you think this, this blew up uh, in, the, in the past week? Um, well, listen, there's the, part of it is just right. Partisan energy, right. But, you know, the president almost can't say anything without, you know, some partisan kickback. Um, mm -hmm. but this in particular, I think stung, um, because he's speaking to a religiously literate crowd. That was, at the, it was, this was at the national prayer breakfast. Mm -hmm. Um, no, none of the pastors invited have sacked cities in the Eastern hemisphere <laughs> and like put heads on pikes. Um, and you know, there is, I think there's also just something in the Christian conservative id right now. Um, and, and justly so is that, you know, for six months, eight months, we've been getting headlines of about ISIS doing the exact sort of things that precipitated the original crusades mm -hmm. um for for reasons that um you know strike us as just is that you know eastern christians are being persecuted in in a way that's new energetic and horrifying their their shrines are being destroyed they're you know they're being forced into exile um and then you have the president um sitting in front of a bunch of softy pastors who mostly wear nice suits uh <laughs> telling us that you know the crusades and analogizing the crusades to things like jim crow slavery or isil that um don't strike that audience as particularly just because um while there are certainly many outrages that are featured in the crusades um you know i think actually a lot of uh christians would happily claim some of the goals or some of the, the reasons for launching them were just in the first place. Mm -hmm. And, um, and certainly some of the results, I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about, uh, the point Ross Douthat, I think tried to make and made pretty well was when you're talking about the crusades, you're talking about like 400 years of civilization, uh, and civilizational conflict, um, mm -hmm. between the Christian West and the Muslim uh, Eastern and along several different fronts. And, um, so to reduce them, you know, a, maybe an apt comparison would have been, um, an apt, but maybe not as accessible comparison would have been saying something like the, um, the Rhineland massacres that were a feature of the first crusades where, uh, Christians plundered and killed Jews in the Rhineland kind of on their way east or you know or even if you wanted to the sack of jerusalem which was you know a bloody affair of the first crusade mm -hmm. um but to analogize isil which is this you know 18 month um phenomenon to 500 years of civilization that are are really complex and which not all the effects or goals of i think we want to disown um mm -hmm. i think that's what is the real nub of it. Um, but I also think that there's just the, um, for a lot of people, a lot of liberals and, and progressives, or a lot of agnostics and atheists, the Crusades just sounds utterly noxious, right? Like just 
top to bottom, the whole idea of, um, you know, religion and war uh, being fused together in, in some way is, mm -hmm. I don't know, gross. And, and it certainly is, uh, you know, challenging. I mean, the whole, the, the crusade, um, you know, there are no crusades in the church anymore. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, um, you know, the Inquisition, which he also mentioned, does still exist in the in the Catholic Church, at least. Um, right. Joseph Ratzinger was the head of that office. Right. Um, before he became Pope. Um, you know, that the, there's still an institutional, uh, I don't know, trace of, of the, the Inquisition. Uh, so anyway, that's I think that's the, the start of the controversy. Um, and um, I, for someone like myself, who, you know, uh, identifies with the Catholic Church, which has a continuous history throughout the Crusades to today, and, you know, I was also a medieval studies major when I was in school. Oh, really? Okay, great. So you, so you are really an expert, or at least... I, I'm not <laughs> an expert. Close, close I mean, I'm, an, an I'm a gen like, like in all things a columnist, I'm a generalist, but, uh -huh. um, and I actually studied more of the wars happening in Europe than the ones happening on the edges of it. Uh, uh -huh. But, you know... Um, you know, I'm intimate, I'm familiar with the crusading, the theology, the ideology and, mm -hmm. and, um, the events of the crusades, although I, you know, am very, just as likely as anyone to slip on a particular name or a knight or confuse Baldwin the fourth with Baldwin the <laughs> second. Oh, uh, okay. Well, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure in the comments, someone will, you know, correct any yeah. errors we have. And, and you, and we can say that you probably know more about this period than 98% of the other people who uh, are commenting on this. So I, I want to just go back and, and just read the part, read from Obama's speech. Uh, it's about two yeah. paragraphs, just so we can get the whole thing before we dig into it. Uh, so he says, so how do we as people of faith reconcile these realities, the profound good, the strength, the tenacity, the compassion and love that can flow from all of our faiths, all of our faiths operating alongside those who seek to hijack religions, religious for their own mur murderous ends. Humanity has been grappling with these questions throughout human history. Unless we get on our high horse and think this is unique to some other place, remember that during the Crusades and the Inquisition, people committed terrible deeds in the name of Christ. In our home country, slavery and Jim Crow all too often was justified in the name of Christ. Michelle and I returned from India, an incredible, beautiful country full of magnificent diversity, but a place where in past years, religious faiths of all types have on occasion been targeted by other peoples of faith simply due to their heritage and their beliefs. Acts of intolerance that would have shocked Gandhi, the person who helped to liberate that nation. So this is, that, this is not unique to one group or one religion. There is a tendency in us, a sinful tendency that can pervert and distort our faith. In today's world, when hate groups have their own Twitter accounts and bigotry can fester in hidden places in cyber cyberspace, it can be even harder to counteract such intoler intolerance, but God compels us to try. Okay, so can't, I mean, wouldn't most people agree that what he said here is true, that during the Crusades and the Inquisition, people committed terrible deeds in the name of Christ? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that, that is true. It is, um, you know, I think what people object to, and, and this, you know, technically is not something he said, right? Um, what I'm about to say is um, it's not the last word on the Crusades themselves, right? Um, sort of like terrible deeds were done in the age of democracy, you know? That's mm -hmm. obviously true, but also not totally complete um, or sufficient. And and as I said, the 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 reaction is in part driven by, um, uh, you know, partially just a, a chauvinistic defense of like, hey, this is our history, our faith was involved, and um, you know, I don't want, and we don't want the last word on this to just be that the Crusades were bad period finito that's at the end uh -huh. um do you, do you see a difference between i mean most of the people latched onto the crusades bit but you also mentioned the inquisition i saw a couple you know bill donahue i think said something about how the inquisition wasn't so bad um do you think do you see a difference between these two references i i mean i do and i i mean you know donahue you know the the inquisition there is a 
let me say a little bit more broadly. Like, there's always in all human affairs, and even in ISIL, there is some kind of logic or 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 something compelling about it that causes humans to be engaged in it. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, so the the Inquisition was yes, partially a response to the fact that European countries uh, or European we're not even really talking about countries. We're talking about like fiefdoms and kingdoms and, and um, you know, kind of proto uh, nations um, saw heresy as a um, capital offense, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and the state was the uh, institution that had the vehicle to punish these things. Um, but the church in an ongoing and kind of continuous um, back and forth with worldly powers, um, in the Inquisition kind of uh, tried to assert itself as the as the competent authority for judging and distinguishing heresy from not um, from something that isn't heresy, and that um, that struggle. Um, for the church's own authority in this matter uh, plays out not just in the Inquisition, but in the Crusades itself. Um, you know, when uh, the Fourth Crusade, which famously ended up sacking the Christian city of Constantinople instead of um, going straight to Jerusalem to to shore up the Crusader state there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the the Crusaders partially justified it to themselves by saying that you know, these, these people are heretics, you know, we're perfectly, uh, they are uh, out of communion with the Pope, we're perfectly in a legitimate situation to um, uh, sack the city. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, for, that, because that was part of the Eastern Church? Yes. But, you know, and the Pope himself was condemning this, is that, you know, this is not what this crusade was about, I don't authorize this, I don't, um, this isn't what I want. So, mm-hmm. um, it, that the Inquisition was this uh, attempt by the church to kind of wrest control. Sometimes worldly authorities took back the power, the the inquisitorial justice system from the church, as they did in Spain. And there are, you know, you know, if if people want to go and read, uh, there's a Jewish historian Henry Common who wrote a good book on the Spanish Inquisition. I highly recommend it. Um, you know, I read the proceedings of inquisition trials in, you know, college and, um, you know, sometimes a thing calling itself the inquisition will look exactly like what we fear it would look like, which is just a mob, uh, executing, um, somebody that they don't like who maybe says something, um, weird or different about religion or the the truths of religion. And then sometimes you read these long, detailed accounts where you have, you know, Franciscan friars or Dominican friars interviewing the accused and going through all sorts of, um, you know, issuing these long reports about their mental state, their education, uh, their ability to understand the concepts that they're even saying, um, you know, detailing all their own efforts to try to like elucidate what, what was happening spiritually or, or mentally with this person, their own attempts to try to persuade this person to, um, accept the the true faith, um, or to at least recant some, some untrue statement, um, or to even, um, you know, find a way to, uh, vindicate the, the victim. Uh, without them saying it. So, you know, it's, um, like I said, we're talking about uh, hundreds of years of history that um, happening in countries that, well, happening at a time when they're, the uh, worldly authority is not nearly as stable as, as we think of it today in the modern world. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of ambiguity. But the, what we refer to popularly as the Inquisition um, had some really awful aspects to it. I mean, you know, the, the church did essentially, uh, the church rarely was involved, um, 
as an executioner itself. But I mean, it would issue verdicts that they knew result it would result in burning someone to death in the name of God. Um, and um, you know, the English history made a lot of this in um, you know what we call the Black Legend of the Inquisition where it's kind of exaggerated, you know, the amount of death is exaggerated for effect, you know, like English historians that were trying to justify separation from the Roman church would talk about, and, and hatred of Spain and fear of Spain would talk about the Spanish Inquisition as executing millions of people over its lifetime when, you know, we're talking, you know, hundreds over hundreds of years. Um, so, so anyway, there's, uh, the Inquisition is, I think, easier to condemn as a, a, as part of a larger inadequate or, or malformed part of Christian history and civilization. That, mm-hmm. That's fine. Even if um, the medievalist in me is like anxious to correct some of the popular imagination about what it was like. Um, mm-hmm. so, th- so there's that. The Crusades separately... Um, you know, also have their popular um, misinterpretations. And I think of the movie in uh, the last decade, Kingdom of Heaven. Did you ever mm. see this? No, I, the, is that the Rid- Ridley Scott one? Yeah. I did not see that one. And, you know, it kind of has like these, these uh, you know, um, how do I put it? Like crude Latin Christians invade like sophisticated, beautiful mostly tolerant Islamic world and Saladin wise general, like, um, uh, you know, makes them pay for it, um, uh-huh. in some ways. And, and, um, you know, the star of the film on the Latin Christian side, you know, gradually comes to see how stupid wars of religion are, you know, it was kind of like, um, <laughs> you know, uh, it wasn't, a, wasn't a pro crusade. So no, no, not at all. Art. And, and, you know, how do you, it's an interesting question for when you look back on the Crusades is how do you distinguish what was, um, say the normal practice of war in the middle ages? Like what was, what was the norm of war in the middle ages when you were sacking a city? And then how do you judge the element of adding a religious dimension or conflict to it? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so, um, and, and the one thing that when people popularly complain of the Crusades, I want to ask them is, okay, so like, what would you wish happened instead? Um, you know, you can <laughs> cite like certain things like that are obvious, like the, the Rhineland massacres or the sack of Constantinople and say like, that was evil. And, and that other thing was stupid. Uh-huh. And they were, and they were recognized at the time as stupid and counterproductive. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, when the second and third crusades were, were, um, I mean, how far back should I go? Like, do, should I explain like <laughs> what a crusade is? <laughs> well, I think, I mean, you know, most people probably have the popular conception uh, more or less that I do. Um, and, and like I said, you know, Indiana Jones and the last crusade <laughs> maybe is, is the most popular conception. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, so I guess part of the question is like, you know, so the medieval period, which you can surely speak to much better than I can, had, you know, basically nonstop, you know, warfare somewhere in, in Europe and yeah. what's now called the Middle East. And we would not call pre- very, you know, we would call very few of these wars like justified today. Like most of them were just, uh, you know, the rulers trying to get more territory. Yeah. In a, in, and in a lot of cases, yeah, that, I mean, there that's. That is part of it, right? And and and, sh- and surely there were in any medieval military conflict there were like massacres that today we would say were human rights violations or you know would get the the perpetrators sent to the Hague or something right. today, right? Well, because I mean, that I mean that was just right and how everything was and even like our attitude about about violence and victory and 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 peace are very different. Um, you know, so, uh, and, and the Crusades weren't, um, 
you know, one part of the, the scholarship that I think has been retrieved more and more in the past 50 years is, is the, the element of crusaders um, who were not military age men um, and, you know, some, and not even carrying arms necessarily. Um, you know, there's an element of the crusade, which was um, literally like a kind of mass activism. Um, the first crusaders that really got far into Muslim territory were mostly not soldiers. They were led by, um, they were a group of, of Christians, Latin Western Christians uh, that were moved by the preaching of Peter the Hermit, who was kind of the most famous of the early, the first crusades preachers. Um, and they included old women and children and they were freaking annihilated. Um, that, you know, that they went, they marched to the East and, and you have to think about how fantastic an idea this is. It's like, I mean, some of us struggle to like take the Acela to Washington DC and we're talking about people <laughs> Um, marching 2,000 miles or longer. Um, to uh, so, so what were their, their goals? They wanted to get to Jerusalem? Yeah, they, they wanted to get to Jerusalem. They wanted to kind of assert their, their right to pilgrimage there, even though, you know, um, it, it was rare for, for Christians in the West to pilgrimage to Jerusalem in the East. Um, and the, the preaching of the Crusades noted that, that basically when the Seljuk Empire um, kind of drove out, Abbas, kind of took over the, the, uh, the Holy Land from the Abbasids and other rival Islamic powers, the civil rights essentially for Christians began to change. And um, Christians in the East, uh, in Constantinople, were under military pressure from the Seljuk Empire on their end. And then also Christians existing in the Holy Land were um, more harassed. Their 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 ability to pilgrimage to holy sites was blocked. Um, like it was a deteriorating situation. So mm -hmm. the uh, emperor in Constantinople asks the pope for help. The the religious imagination of the West flowers into this idea of pilgrimage and crusade, which um, was a mix of armed pilgrimage and military uh, campaign. Um, so lots of people went that weren't military age. Uh, you know, one of the popular theories was that Europe had had this huge uh, population boom in the previous century and had all of these second and third and fourth tier sons who were not going to advance very far in Europe and had to make their <laughs> fortune elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's one part of the dynamic, but what you also see is, is um, you know, extremely prominent lords from France, France especially, and from England, um, you know, in the Third Crusade, Richard the Lionheart, or, um, you know, the Baldwins, or these others, you know, who had spent, you know, a portion of their adult lives warring and, and conquering in France or in England, expanding their territory, um, gaining wealth and power. And then some of them see this, this, the idea of crusading to Jerusalem as a chance in a way to kind of redeem their lives, right? That they'd, they'd done these things for themselves for decades. Now they could spend their riches and their power and strength doing something for God. And they, they, um, you know, one of the major features of the Crusades was that there was an indulgence offered by the church to crusaders. Um, you know, indulgences are still offered to pilgrims today um, to go to holy sites. Uh, but this is one particularly exciting one for Europe's military class. So, um, so the, the indulgence would be a, a kind of a pardoning of sins? Yeah, pardoning of, of the, the punishment due to sin. Um, mm -hmm. And... Um, and so you see, like, men really, like, risking their fortunes. And, and, and one of the things is, like, in the Third Crusade, especially, like, Richard the Lionheart is very notable in, uh, in that he's a brilliant military commander, he's a brilliant leader, and while he's crusading, he knows that his, his lands are being 
back in 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 France and elsewhere are being you know ravaged up by his his brother and brothers in law and um, um you know so not all of this was um and the other thing is, is too is that so it, it, what you're saying is that like this you know people who were engaged in this you know some of them had pure intentions well they um, they they had it wasn't like they were just going to conquer land or like win glory or something like they had an intention that even today we would recognize as being more or less a good one i mean I, you know it's funny because it's like would we recognize it as 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 good i don't know um it, they definitely had um they demonstrate i'll say this they demonstrated an ability to sacrifice and take on real danger for a mission that they believed in and you know some of the testimonies we have um the first crusade uh, was called you know i told you this initial wave of, that were more um pilgrims without much military training or experience were annihilated but the, the first wave of latin christian crusaders went on this long journey they were underprepared, ill-organized, ill-equipped, but the element of just total surprise, they did sack Jerusalem. They, they did conquer Jerusalem. Um, and this was a, a, a monstrous scandal to the Islamic world, was, you know, how did this, this band of idiots, basically, <laughs> uh, do this? And... Um, so what's funny is like some of the accounts the crusaders give we we think of as really damning right because the crusade the accounts the crusaders give talk about blood up to your ankles or up to your knees in jerusalem mm -hmm. right so everyone in the medieval world would know that blood up to your knees in a city is not even physically possible <laughs> right mm -hmm. but this is like, i'm reminded of did you ever read any of the like uh authorian myths yeah so they often had like one of the constant tropes is when they're fighting is like their their um you know their armor fills with blood up to their ankles like that, that's like every single fight right. that happens in in like you know jeffrey of monmouth whatever that guy's name is you know is described in the same very repetitive way of like you know blood up to their ankles yes and 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 these same accounts that we rely on to, to say how horrible these atrocities were and were in a way like they were they were propaganda accounts to bolster the support for crusading um mm -hmm. and these same accounts say that you know soldiers and and you can believe this if you want um saw saints and angels descending onto the field of battle to help them i mean uh, that's mm -hmm. uh, you know, and should we doubt that they believe that? I don't know. Um, uh -huh. But um, the the success of the first crusade um, informed the uh, religious imagination for all the subsequent ones. Um, you know, this was a, a story of heroism and bravery, and um, and uh, it. it I, you know, kids over the next, you know, hundreds of years were raised on these tales of, of, uh, of bravery. Um, mm -hmm. and that, that created support for, for sustaining the small crusader state, um, where Jerusalem is, which was mm -hmm. always, um, harassed and under pressure. Um, and at the same time, the, the, the crusading movement also changed the character of wars within Europe where, um, you know the reconquista of 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 Spain by Christians uh, became a crusade over time. Mm -hmm. it, it became reconceptualized as a crusade, um, and because of that, it drew more people to it, um, especially when the indulgences were attached to it. Um, mm -hmm. And and so you know, I think the modern Christian, when they hear the Crusades invoked, says like. You know, if you want to say these are all bad, do you think, you know, would you rewrite history of a Muslim Spain or Muslim victory at Lepanto, you know, hundreds of years later? Or, um, you know, do you think, uh, you know, are you happy that the, um, uh, you know, any, any number of the results that happened? I mean, one of the things right. that's really bad, uh, the bad mark on the Crusades is sacking even by their own terms, is sacking Constantinople. Because, I mean, 
the, the city never recovered. I mean, this was by far the richest Christian city on the planet. Um, and, and in a way, the Crusaders uh, doomed it forever um, with their siege. So uh, in the Fourth Crusade. So anyway, that's mm -hmm. those are the Crusades, and and it's a it's a it's a <laughs> it's a fascinating, complicated history. There was Crusades in Europe. I mean, the um, you know one of the most infamous ones is the Albigensian Crusade in France, where um, you know in order to stop the spread of the Catharist heresy, eventually this uh, turned into a, a you know a bloodbath of, of murdering both Christians and heretics. Um, Mm -hmm. And the famous line, like, kill them all, let God sort them out, is said to have come from there. Um, so <laughs> Okay, so, okay, so I, I mean, you, you've explained, I think, fairly well for the lay, you know, the lay person, the, you know, complexity of the crusade and some of the historical reasons that they happened. And, you know, I can't, I don't think you could say, uh, you know, the results of the crusade were 100% bad. Yeah. But why, I guess the question I had is why did so many... Uh, Christians and Catholics in particular like take the, what Obama said which as I read it you know it seems like a fairly neutral statement that most people agree to you know horrible deeds are create, were committed in the name of Christ um, like why did so many people take that as like an attack on like their current identity? I think, I think, it's, I, I think it's the notion that Obama um, uh, there's a couple things, right? So, like, one of the things that offended me about it, uh, I'll start there, um, which I hope is is the most defensible reading of, of why be offended, was that in some ways, I mean, this is um, a president who, for reasons that David Frum, I think, explained very well, and for, for justifiable reasons, perhaps, avoids uh, describing Islamic State as Islamic. And and even go so far as to say that it's a perversion of Islam, and and um, you know, in a sense, tries to, and like I said, there are justifiable reasons to do this: is is to kind of de deprive Islamic State of Islamic legitimacy. Um, but then, in a sense, ISIS is currently crucifying people in the name of Islam. Who is getting on their high horse at the at the prayer breakfast, and who needs this tutoring? I think what mm -hmm. what offended people what was um, one also just sort of like whenever the Crusades have been mentioned after nine eleven by a president, it's been a problem, right? And, and, and in some ways, it like it's using the rhetoric that Bin Laden and others kind of created, uh, you know, or imported into the modern world that. United States represents, you know, is the modern representation of crusaders. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I believe in the, the execution of these uh, Coptic Christians in Libya, they, you know, the ISIS people refer to them as crusaders. Isn't that right? Right. And of course, you know, like, Copts have been around in Egypt longer than Islam has been on the planet. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so... Um, but they, but they see you know they see Christians as um, you know many Islamists in the Middle East see Christians as a kind of fifth column um, in their own society. So so it, that annoyed me was was sort of like adopting um, in a sense like Bin Ladenist rhetoric that crusading is a problem for the West you know to think about now. Um, right. Well, I mean, I mean, Bush, you know, I, I can't remember the history exactly, but something happened very early on after 9-11 where Bush said something like, 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 this will be a noble crusade. Yeah, this is a crusade. Like, he, yeah. He, yeah, he, yeah, he caught flack for that. And then I think he stopped saying that because I mean, yeah, so the crusade language plays into the West versus Islam narrative that ISIS uh, wants to you know, promote yeah. that some people in the West want want to promote as well. Yeah, and listen, I mean, I, you know, I've been thinking about the Crusades a lot myself lately, too. I mean, there was a report in Reuters about American Christians traveling to Iraq to fight ISIS and to protect Chaldean Christians in Iraq. And, yeah, there's a part of my heart, too, that says, geez, if I didn't have a wife and child, like, and someone said, maybe you should do this, like, and I know, of course, you know, 
um, Max Fisher and others are, uh, at Vox are saying, like, geez, do we really need more religious militancy <laughs> coming into uh, this region? But, like, for the same exact reasons that Crusaders were inspired to to go east, um, yeah, it, it, I, I can feel that today, even with all my knowledge of how bad it can go, that, yeah, it's horrible that these holy sites are being destroyed in Iraq. And mm-hmm. it, these, this defenseless community is being destroyed. I mean, I, um, I visited Egypt um, uh, late in the Mubarak years, and I walked in and around the Coptic neighborhoods, and I went to their churches, and, you know, um, Copts and, and Catholics are not in communion. They have their own pope, and, you know, the priest was showing me the portraits of all the Coptic popes throughout history, and... It's very funny. You have to like pay the priest for him to show you any room in a church. You know, they just, it's, it's more of an Arab thing of just like, okay, you're a rich American. Like you might as well just, you know, pass some money. And um, I was struck at the time, just how vulnerable that community was. And I felt um, connected to them. You know, the, the, mm-hmm. the existence of Middle Eastern Christians in a sense, imaginatively connects me with Christian history, with the history of martyrdom and and sacrifice. And um... what you're saying, you know, this is, you know, there was a, t- a piece in the Times um, this week uh, profiling a a young um, Egyptian um, man who joined ISIS and kind of going through like, why did this happen? And interviewing the friends he left behind and he seemed like someone who was uh moderately westernized he did these like iron like pumping iron kind of videos and he wanted to become like a personal trainer and he thought about leaving egypt oh, yeah, yeah. and you know so trying to sit, decide like why you know why did this one individual become radicalized and why are a number of young muslim men becoming radicalized and deciding they want to go join isis so it seems like kind of a similar you know <laughs> like like their narrative is kind of similar to the narrative you know you're describing it's it's the counter image right is yeah is is you is you see an outrage perpetrated on your people yeah. um and and you want to fight them i do think um uh what graham wood's piece in the atlantic got at though is that there there is a um uh, one of the differences uh why there are more men going uh to Islamic State than going to to join, you know, the Chaldean Christians is that Islamic State provides um, an overarching meaning to going mm-hmm. and, and a, a kind of a narrative for why it's urgent right now mm-hmm. um, that isn't, uh, you know, that's more compelling than anything that's happening where, you know, my just anger and rage that just that these atrocities are happening mm-hmm. um so I, th- I i i i agree that there is you know it is uh, just a phenomenon to see an outrage happening and and make no mistake about it like the one of the reasons isis had this opening was the the collapse of civil authority and the, the opening of sectarian war in iraq and in the sunni triangle mm-hmm. um You know, there are absolutely legitimate grievances that Sunnis living in the Sunni triangle have. And, you know, there's no way you, you, um, there's no way to expect that there wasn't going to be some assertion, even a violent one, of their political uh, will. Um, That it took this form is, 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 I think, what's so... Uh, troubling to us right now, right? And 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 that it's and that it's attracting foreign fighters um, to the degree that it is, mm-hmm. and is and um, maybe like the first crusade, you know, it, th- these look like to Obama the JV team, right? Mm-hmm. Which is exactly what you know Saladin and others thought of the crusaders <laughs> when they came over, right? Um, um, uh, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I think there's yeah, the, I think there's you know, the parallels go deeper than I think maybe uh, people are, are, are realizing here. Um, well, and, and, you know, it's funny because there are all these, 
you know, if um, if people want to read something like, there's a book, A Concise History of the Crusades, which is a short, breezy book that, that <laughs> kind of takes you through the history. A beach, a beach read, uh, what do you say? Pay, you know, kind of. <laughs> um, but, you know, and you'll see things that are, are interesting. So once the Crusaders are established in Jerusalem, and a, a small number of them stay and live there, and, and but that was one of the problems was that people went, they crusaded, and then they went home. You know, they got their indulgence, they made their pilgrimage to the holy sites and left. Mm -hmm. But Christians that, Western Latin Christians that stayed um, and built families and, and, and so on, you know, you see these little um, culture clashes that still exist today, which, you know, Muslims record with great horror in the Middle Ages that these crusaders, how they allowed their women to flaunt themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, and they and they, they were shocked that like these crusader men who conquered Jerusalem allowed their women to walk with other men, and you know, um, you know th that enduring uh, uh, difference between uh, th there is an enduring kernel of difference between Islam and Christianity, and and how they've treated women. Um, or, or how they've conceived of what men and women are mm -hmm. that, that exists a thousand years later um, yeah, it, in, it, in different forms. And in this, this article that we'll link to that was in the Times, it talks a lot about how the sexual frustration felt by this one individual seems like it was channeled into back into religion, and, uh, and that kind of led to his you know being more open to, to radicalization. Um, I want to ask you one other question about this. So it seems, it seems to me that that part of the kind of outrage about what Obama said is that there's a number of people who implicitly believe and some who explicitly believe, believe like Eric Erickson, that Obama is not actually a Christian. Um, yeah. So Erickson, he wrote, um, Barack Obama is not in any meaningful way a Christian. Um, I wish the president would stop professing himself to be a Christian if he's not going to proclaim Christ as truth and the only way to salvation, because I believe... Obama gave some kind of ecumenical statement at the national prayer breakfast, which is supposed to be national. Um, and, and, but then it does, it does seem kind of like a belief among the right, not that Obama is a secret Ken, Kenyan Muslim anti-colonialist, but that he, you know, this Christian thing is just kind of like a sham and he doesn't really believe this. He just did it for politics. There's probably people on the left to believe this as well. Yeah. I was going to ask you, if, do you believe like, in 10 years or something as post president Obama would be like, well, and he might come out and say like, <laughs> well, I wasn't, I was an atheist. And, um, you know, I, you know, I actually, I, I mean, and, I can't and, and, like, in a, in a way, like in a good hearted gesture to say like, Hey, you've elected the atheist before <laughs> maybe this new candidate 10 years from now, uh, you should consider that. Right. Well, I mean, I can't, it's hard to know what he believes in his heart of hearts. I mean, he wrote in dreams to my father, um, that he had a, you know, conversion moment, and you could see, you could say that he wrote that because he aspired to political office sometime in the future, but um, he didn't, you know, you know, he went to Reverend Wright's church, and right. he, like he could have gone to a different church, like you know, he could have gone to like a Presbyterian church or something. I think yeah. I think he did have a, a genuine religious experience, and I think he is, I think he is a genuine Christian. Um, I mean, what do you think? I, I mean, I think, um, I mean, I have no reason, I, I have no good reason to, to doubt his, his profession of faith as he gives it, um, you know, that you could argue, right, that, you know, um, you know, I, I, I you know what how does he conceive of his religion is it like um you know is it something that's like a set of convictions uh, like i think someone like erickson and, and even myself um in a different way would would wonder like okay obama is your religion something that kind of defines the way you view the world or is it kind of a set of of convictions that are super added onto reality mm -hmm. like or is it um you know, I mean, I, I would be interested, you know, um, 
it would be inappropriate to ask this and too accusatory to ask this, but like, you know, if you want to ask someone about their Christianity, just ask them, okay, what do you believe about the resurrection? Mm-hmm. You know, and I have no idea. I have no idea what Obama would say, and then and then further would argue about how to qualify that. So if you, if you believe that the that um, you know he could take an ultra like liberal or progressive view of of the resurrection and say like the resurrection is an event that symbolizes the transformation the apostles felt after the death of Jesus et cetera, et cetera. But no, it doesn't involve like a body mm-hmm. coming up out of a tomb and walking around and, and apparating right. uh, around Palestine, you know? <laughs> so does that mean he's not a Christian? Um, you know, it certainly means he's not what I believe, um, uh-huh. you know, is a minimum kind of requirement, but you know, that so that that question is out there is, is where does what does this occupy um you know and and for Erickson and I think for a lot of evangelicals they just you know they say that there's there's a certain minimal creedal adherence you have to have and furthermore that if you are a real christian there'll be evidence of your life that would preclude all manner of things that obama supports or does or Etc. So right. Okay. So it, yeah. Okay. You know, so it, it's hard. It's hard to know. But if we okay, if we accept that Obama is a Christian, which yeah. I think is you know, we, and I think I, I think be, I would, we should at least accept would, that. Then when, I would do that. Then when he says this thing about the Crusades and the Inquisition, he's implicating his own faith in that. And so that's I think that what, that's what that's what is getting Coates, missed in this. That's what Coates says, but it really does. Uh, but I I don't think that. Um, I don't think you can say that because the Protestant Reformation, especially as it was conceived by later Protestants, is what the Protestant Reformation is, is the idea that like, well, the medieval church was completely corrupted over time. And some would say even even the, the church of late antiquity had kind of veered off course. And the Protestant Reformation was this attempt to purify it of the the things that would cause crusades or inquisitions mm-hmm. um you know I, there are lots of evangelicals um there are lots of protestants today who would uh, the inquisition is something that they define their their christianity against mm-hmm. you know in a, in a very explicit historical way um so um you know i don't know what ownership he he feels are you know you know his father was um a continent away like you know mm-hmm. it's sort of like uh, you know i have um i'm an american like am i implicated in british crimes of of the 15th century right or am i not implicated in them because i have an irish father who lives in ireland and 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 my my mother's side was descended from the Irish. Uh-huh. So am I? Am I? You know, where where does my heritage become implicated in this? Right. Uh, but I mean, I guess the other th- question I kind of had about this whole thing was like, well, you know, our current our current people living in England are there are they implicated in the crimes of you know the British Empire? Like, you know, like why? And, and who who's implicated in the crimes of the Seljuk Empire, or the Abbasids? <laughs> You know, like there is another side to the Crusades. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's 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 clear. But like, but why should like anyone? I mean, so these things happened nine hundred, a thousand years ago. You know, why why should anyone at this a thousand you know a thousand years later, a millennium later, feel implicated in this? Like, you know, I so I, I don't like I said I don't know a lot about the medieval period. Most of what I know about English history from this period is from the Shakespearean histories. You know, the Henry V shows that. Um, the you know his invasion of France was like you know uh, premised on this like false claim of linkage to the you know French throne and like so that was like a scam and Shakespeare you know knew this at the time and put it in there and so like should like someone living in England today feel like some kind of historical guilt for like the you know invasion on false pretenses of, of France you know in in like the 1400s like it just seems right. like how far back do you have to go right and and I mean and and you know, this is a question, you know, I've been, lately I've been 
you know, uh, preoccupying myself with looking at, you know, the politics of Northern Ireland and, and, you know, do the unionists who give their loyalty to Britain there, you know, how are they implicated in, in the battle of the Boyne? Um, are they implicated only because they celebrate it or march to it? And how are they implicated by it? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I do think we are implicated by our history and and by what we own of it, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I actually do think I have to, by my own religious convictions, I have to to own up and be implicated in the the history of of the church mm -hmm. uh, in a way that I think Obama actually doesn't have to be mm -hmm. um, on this on these particular cases. Yeah. Um. So the, and and that's that's fine. Um. You know, but there is like a rather glibly like we're talking about the crusades but you know maybe there's only one side still fighting them like um um i don't know how you apportion that you know who's if i'm implicated in the crusades who's implicated in the seljuks and in the abbasids and yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I think the the easier thing is to say is that you are not actually implicated in the Crusades because it happened right. a millennium ago, and it was a completely different world. Like, you know, are we, so we are both Americans, but we were both born after the Vietnam War. Are we like implicated in the crimes that were committed? You know, the war crimes that were committed in Vietnam. I mean, I don't think I I wouldn't say we're guilty of them, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we we're not, but we you you do live with them, right? Like, mm -hmm. you you know, one thing that um. If we're talking about historical, if we are talking about history, um, this is where a writer like Ta-Nehisi Coates is so strong, which is that, okay, you and I are born, you know, um, centuries almost, almost, you know, almost two centuries after Andrew Jackson was born. Mm -hmm. um, or, no, exactly almost two centuries after Andrew Jackson was born. Mm -hmm. So, like, are we implicated in, um, you know, the Indian Removal Act or in, um, or in white supremacy as conceived then? Mm -hmm. And I think the answer is yes, we are, uh, in, in the sense that we still enjoy an inherited privilege of it, mm -hmm. yeah. right? That makes sense. So the existence of, like, the existence of Spain itself is, like, implicated in the history of, of the reconquista like right but should the, should current like could should current day should current day spaniards be beating their breasts about the fact that the jews were expelled in 1492 um no no i don't think so i mean you know in the sense of uh i think there's a duty to remember right mm -hmm. um but no i don't think there's a, a duty to um and to remember well, and I think there's also just a human duty to, um, to reflect on the the line between e good and evil that runs through every human heart. Mm -hmm. right? Like that, there is that level. Mm -hmm. But no, I don't think um, uh, it would be presumptuous and and silly and nonsensical of me to go up to Tanahisi Coates and apologize for slavery you know right. even it, it, it would be silly in a way and, and supercilious and, and a weird weird signal but should i be conscious of the inherited privilege um and disadvantage that has accrued um because mm -hmm. of american history mm -hmm. yeah that's absolutely uh, and, 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 you know, I'm as reactionary as can be. I don't think that the, you know, <laughs> I, I, I de detest the sort of like, um, y you know, the showy signaling of checking your privilege, mm -hmm. but there is a kernel of truth in it, in, in that you should be aware of it. And, um, I don't know, I think just one of the, the main, um, uh, responsibilities of being an adult is, um, is knowing what's is recognizing how little of um how much you inherit right um from the world mm -hmm. and from history mm -hmm. uh and that's the good and the bad um you know um 
I understand the more the, the more populist reaction of, of 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 retching at that and saying like, hey, I have a hard life enough. Um, you know, if if you're a poor white West Virginian, um, I don't know. Endless reflection on the sins of your forebears may not uh, <laughs> seem like it's much use to you. Mm-hmm. Um, well, the West and, Virginians can take you know solace in the fact that they decided to leave Virginia because they just didn't want to have anything to do with this. You know? Right. I, I mean, that's that's the thing is is like, yeah. and, and and also I mean, history should the study of history should inspire us in us a bit of humility, right? Yeah. You know, like one thing I. I I, I take from looking at the Crusades um, is one. What's interesting about the Crusades is it's it's un, it's unanimous. Like the European consensus for the Crusades was unanimous. The only question was, are you going? Can you go? How much are you willing to sacrifice? Go. Mm-hmm. There's like no. Dis, there's practically no dissent. There's disagreement about tactics, about motives. There's disagreement about individual acts. But um, there's like no disagreement. I mean, this is like a unanimous. Like that's why I think some people retched the, at the comparison because it's almost like saying, uh, you know, if you damn the Crusades entirely, it's, it's sort of like saying, well, the liberation of France in World War II was bad because of Indian removal in 1830. <laughs> like there is like a there's a chronological and 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 causative problems yeah um you know it's like both both of those things have something to do with democracy just as like you know uh the rhineland massacre or sack of constantinople both have to do with crusades Mm -hmm. Uh, but so does you know the reestablishment of uh so does the liberation of christians in in spain from the jizya or the the restoration of pilgrimage to the holy land for christians um Mm -hmm. uh, you know um anyway so there's a the study of history should inspire us a humility and and one thing i would urge on people who think that the crusades are so foreign to them is that if if like in your lifetime there's been a moral fad or a moral cause that suddenly seemed to come from nowhere and capture your attention and capture your energy and your activism you're exactly the sort of person who would have been really enthusiastic <laughs> about the Crusades and the Albigensian Crusade, mm-hmm. like, which was one of the most horrible ones. Um, you know, so, um, and maybe that's a retreat into, like I said, the, the line that is in every human heart, but uh, I don't know. I think that's what we should take from history, which is part of Obama's point. Um, you know, uh, I'm not defending, I will not defend every outraged reaction to what Obama said. Mm-hmm. I thought it was just impolitic and inopportune and, and, and like a weird way of, um, I don't know, like kind of uh, passive aggressive. Um, well, I mean, well, just getting back to what Obama said briefly, I mean, what it reminded me of is this, like, this is like Obama's classic rhetorical move. He'll say, yeah. well, on the one side, we have these people saying this thing. And on the other side, we have the people saying this thing. But can't we both agree on this thing in the middle, which I represent? So that's like his that's like his classic Obama move. And so that's kind yeah. of that's kind of what we did. We can all we can all agree that ISIS is bad. We can all agree the Crusades are bad. But can't we agree that blah blah blah? Yeah, and I, listen, and, and if that's it, it's it. And in in a way, you know, as the medievalist in me has, has welcomed the the chance to suddenly like talk and think about mm-hmm. um, the the Crusades and. You know, um, it's something, um, you know, if if we're looking forward into the future, we probably will be talking more about the Crusades and medieval history because we just are um, in a period of history of Islamic uh, reascendancy. You yeah, know, I mean, we're, we're, you know, we're explicitly <laughs> at war with a group who is calling its enemies the Crusaders. So, you and, know, this, is, this history them, is, is living, you know, literally alive today. And, and, and um, you know, um, you know, 110 years ago, the view 
of Islam uh, in the West was that like this was a completely spent, dead cultural force. It had no energy, and um, it was dying. Um, and uh, I think since you know perhaps the revolution in Iran, uh, which kind of established um, a Shiite Islamic state, um, you know I think since that moment, maybe a little before, we've seen this assertive um, political Islam um, that I think, uh, you know, not only has the power and has proven its power to topple, you know, the weird kind of 20th century uh, compromises Islamic society made with modernity, you know, like mm -hmm. the Ba'athist party is like a perfect example of a party populated by Muslims, but animated by kind of 20th century ideologies of like pan-Arabism and socialism. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, th I think, uh, you know, the Mubarak regime in, in Egypt is similarly like, looked like a compromise with um, modernity or even imperialism. And I think, um, I think this new uh, political flowering of Islam um, will prove not only transformative to the Middle East, but I think it will. Um, uh, I think it will attract adherence in the West. I'm not saying that people are going to go and join ISIS and, and um, pray for an Iranian nuke um, necessarily, but I think there's a, a kind of global flowering of Islam, and. Um, and uh, even just having it in the news constantly, you know, there was a huge surge in conversions to Islam after 9-11 in America, right? Mm -hmm. It gave people the opportunity to consider uh, the claims of this religion, which are, I think, uniquely appealing in our time. And um, so I, I, you know, uh, the, the kerfuffle about the Crusades, I think this is only the beginning of... of rethinking our our history of of the west and islam um and not just the crusader era but also then the you know we should be thinking about the imperial era and the borders that britain drew all across the middle east that are falling apart now yeah. or are, are covered in uh in blood ankle deep <laughs> let's put it that way yeah um so anyway uh, um you know, people should go out and and read a book about the Crusades. Um, it's and one written by a historian. Um, there are a lot of like stupid popular books out there too. Don't read those. So the one you mentioned, what is who's the author of that, and what is that one called? Um, it's Concise History of the Crusades. I, um, well, we'll we'll track it down I, and link to it in the. Uh, yeah, I promised below. I would forget one. I'd forget a name, and of course, I forget that one. Um, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, anyway, um, it's, you know, that's a nice, fair general history that, of um, the foibles and, and the, um, you know, and, and, and a way of recounting a mindset that might seem very foreign to us. But I think with a little imagination, people can get into it. Um, so, anyway. Yeah, I mean, as I, it, maybe, maybe we should end here, but just one final thing, you know, like studying history... Uh, you know, like, I think my experience was common for many people, like in high school, especially when you're studying like European history, it just kind of all washes over you. And, you know, you're reading about like this invasion here and, the, you know, the, looking at the map and it has like lines on it that are going different directections. And it kind of doesn't make it, you know, doesn't seem like applicable to you at all. But as you read more and more and read good, you know, a solid written history, you see that, you know, the most interesting things is, you know, how regular people were responding to the events that are happening around them. And, you know, these regular people were, you know, more or less like us, you know, they were equally as much as human as, as we are today. And, you know, that really, when you think about it that way, you know, yeah. the, the unfolding of history, you know, becomes. Much yeah. Much I, I mean, you have to, I, it's, it might sound ludicrous, but like to, you need a great deal of human sympathy to, to, to even just make sense of history, right? Like mm -hmm. you have to, and, and that requires a, a, um, a bold and humiliating imagination. 
right? You need to be able to humiliate yourself enough to put yourself into the shoes of a supporter of the Third Reich or of Stalin and, and grasp for yourself, like, okay, what worldview would make the goals of this intelligible and desirable? Um, because if millions of people were in it, there was something human about it, and so there, and there's yeah. something you can learn from it. Um, so anyway, that's that's uh, that's the more you know. The, that's the <laughs> that's the PR message. Yeah, yeah, and what that makes me think is, you know, there's often in you know works of art like American Sniper or something, or in political debates about foreign policy, you know, we want to cast the enemy as not being human. And like, you know, like, what else are they? Like, yes, they are, they are humans. They're they as human as we are. And, and they're doing things that maybe we find despicable or evil. But like, you know, it's kind of a, uh, used uh, as a slur against some people. Like, oh, they're just trying to humanize these, you know, these killers, like these monsters. Like, you know, they're, they're not monsters. Like, they are, they are human. <laughs> yeah. they, they are human. And, and they are human and humans can be monsters uh, yeah. and monstrous. And, and so... Um, yeah. Anyway, so that's the whole conflicting thing. I'm sure the commenters will figure out whether I'm a bad crusader or an apologist <laughs> for ISIS or both. Or, um, or okay. Do, do, do you want to leave it there? We had another possible topic, but we've gone over. No, let's, so. let's leave it there. I gotta, I've got to get running. Okay. Well, thanks so much, uh, Michael. I uh, we'll hope to have you back on again some other time. And thanks to our viewers. Uh, catch us again next time. All right. Take care.